tonight, the dangerous deep freeze in Western Canada. We're still in, in challenging conditions. Record-breaking temperatures put unprecedented pressure on power grids, and it's not over yet. A stunning volcanic eruption in Iceland. Unbelievable. I thought that I would never live to witness this. Lava flows into a town with disastrous results. Canadian superstar Michael Bublé on his songwriting process. We do what's ever best for the song. The song is first. And why he loves pushback. I believe compromise breeds mediocrity. A preview of our feature interview in the breakdown. This is The National with Ian Hennemansi. Canada's west remains frigid cold tonight under a blanket of Arctic air. And as this cold snap drags on, it's putting pressure on critical infrastructure in B.C. and Alberta. Some of the lowest temperatures in the country were recorded in Alberta today. The mercury sinking all the way down to minus 50. Dealing with that means striking a delicate balance between keeping warm and keeping the electrical grid working. In B.C., it's hospitals feeling the pressure, a burst pipe and broken heater adding to the scramble of dealing with those dangerous temperatures. Georgie Smythe shows us how people are coping. For B.C.'s most vulnerable, surviving the biting cold is all-consuming. It's early at this warming shelter, but already people are lined up for respite. There you go, Vince. Vince, here's your chocolate. Mm -hmm. In Edmonton, temperatures are breaking records, dipping to minus 45 on Friday and Saturday. The need for meals and warm clothing was overwhelming. This video shows a large group of people waiting outside one shelter on Friday night. The shelter says it didn't turn anyone away. So we had anticipated and planned for about 50 people in the space. We ended up having 137 people the first night uh, come through the space, 187 the second night, and last night we had 230 people accessing the space. So it's, it's been a pretty significantly higher number than we had anticipated. The demand for electricity so great for the second day in a row, the province sent out a grid alert pleading with people to reduce power consumption or risk brownouts. 100 kilometres east of Calgary, Siksika Nation did experience power outages for hours on Saturday morning and declared a state of emergency. So especially for the elders and some of the more vulnerable, uh, that's still a long time when you're talking about 50 below. Go, Mule! For those in a position to enjoy it, the cold snap gave ample chances to play in the snow in Calgary or on the ice in Vancouver. Experiences that will be hard to forget long after these unprecedented temperatures pass. I've ne I, don't, I have never done it before, so it's really fun. So, Georgie, when is this cold snap supposed to end? Environment Canada says the Arctic ridge that had been anchored over uh, BC and Alberta is weakening, uh, which means that we'll start to see temperatures gradually moderate. It'll get warmer faster in BC, with the forecast already showing a return to more seasonal temperatures. It'll take a little longer uh, for that to happen in Alberta, uh, with warm conditions expected to spread through most of the province by Tuesday. Georgie Smythe in Vancouver. As the West looks forward to warming a little, temperatures in eastern Canada are falling. Wind chills will dip to the minus 20s in parts of Ontario and Quebec tonight, setting up a frigid week ahead as that Arctic air pushes east. Plunging temperatures and severe storms are also creating havoc in the U.S. This was Buffalo, New York today, where heavy snow created whiteout conditions. A travel ban was issued for western New York. The governor saying the storm posed a life and safety risk. High winds and snow also hit the Midwest, where the wind chill was expected to dip into the minus 50s. Texas, Louisiana and Alabama are also bracing for freezing temperatures and snow. And in Iowa, blizzard-like conditions derailed some last-minute campaigning. Tomorrow is the Iowa caucus, the first chance for Republicans to signal who they want on their presidential ticket. Iowa Democrats make their choice by mail. But as Katie Simpson shows us from Des Moines, the weather for the Republicans could be an issue. 
All along Iowa's busiest highways, there are terrifying reminders of what became the state's worst winter storm in decades. The weather forced Republican presidential hopefuls to scale back their campaigning plans, though Donald Trump urged his supporters to go to caucus and vote for him no matter the conditions. You can't sit home. If you're sick as a dog, you say, darling, I gotta make it. Even if you vote and then pass away, it's worth it, remember? Trump is dominating the latest Iowa poll with 48% support. The caucuses are widely expected to be more of a formality to confirm Trump's win than anything else. On this wintry weekend, our CBC News crew was snowed in, forced to stay put in the southern rural town of Mount Pleasant, which happens to be Trump country. One of the few places people ventured out to was the local sports bar. <laughs> and that's where we found Kim Mosley, who plans on voting Trump. She misses how he kept the cost of living under control, but is okay. underwhelmed by all of the Republican candidates in the state of American politics. I feel sorry for my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren, because it's going to be bad. It's getting worse. Just down the street, we met Jay Boland, a salesman who's concerned about the economy. While he's still making up his mind ahead of Monday's caucus, he'll back Trump in the general election if he's the nominee. I do like um, some of his ideas, obviously, but, you know, he is a little divisive, and uh, that, that would be nice to uh, maybe have a little less of that. Trump's divisiveness inspired Mike Bronner to get behind Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. And the way he's run Florida, it has been good. It's an uphill battle, but the retiree hopes other Republicans are growing tired of Trump the way he is. I, I was a Trump guy for the last couple of things, and I, I, yeah, I, I think it's time to uh, start looking. And Katie joins us from Des Moines. Uh, if Trump wins Iowa as expected, what does it mean for the race to become the Republican nominee? It gives Donald Trump a head start as he tries to just bulldoze through this contest. And it makes the race for second place far more interesting. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley are likely going to have to come out of Iowa trying to convince voters, saying, hey, look, we didn't beat him this time, but we're going to be able to eventually beat him down the road. Haley's campaign is the one to watch. She's the one who's building momentum heading into the next part of this race, New Hampshire, where polls show she is within striking distance of Trump. Ian. Katie Simpson in Des Moines. As world leaders gather in Davos, Switzerland for the World Economic Forum, the war in Ukraine is at the top of the agenda. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. The Ukrainian president's chief of staff met with forum leaders on Sunday, trying to rally support for his country's peace plan to end nearly two years of war with Russia. Moscow has dismissed the plan. President Volodymyr Zelensky will address the forum later in the week. It has now been 100 days since Hamas brutally attacked Israel, triggering the war. Inside Gaza, the consequences have been devastating. As Palestinians struggle to survive, the families of Israeli hostages being held by Hamas are trying to remain hopeful. Katie Nicholson has their stories. Mayan Shavit fine-tunes a speech for a rally marking this grim milestone. That's the biggest fear that we have, that after 100 days, people will just say, OK, it's been 100 days. What do you want us to do? Shavit's aunt was murdered on October 7th, along with roughly 1,200 others. Two of her cousins were taken hostage. One has been released. The other, Carmel Gatt, is among the roughly 130 hostages whose fate is still unknown. This is a horror movie, like the one you watch in television, and then you go to sleep and you continue thinking about it, and it just doesn't get out of your mind, and then you feel that you're, you're one of them. You're in the movie, but you can just not wake up, and this is exactly how I feel. Since that day, other horrors have unfolded across Gaza. In 100 days of Israeli bombing and fighting, more than 23,000 Palestinians have been killed, according to the Hamas-run health ministry. Roughly 1.9 million have been displaced. Among them, Tufan al-Aqsa, born on October 7th. A happy moment, his grandfather says, but also a knife to the heart, because he was born as the family lost their home and 11 people. 
They have spent the last 100 days scrambling to keep him alive in their cold tent with almost no supplies. As the humanitarian crisis deepens in Gaza, the UN reports hundreds of thousands are facing starvation. Tensions continue to build around the world with rallies in London and Washington, where protesters pushed up against the security gates outside the White House. Despite international pressure on Israel to wind down its military assault, Benjamin Netanyahu is doubling down, <laughs> pledging to continue the war to total victory. No one, he said, will stop us. Words that are likely to extend this war far beyond 100 days. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. Five Canadian MPs are headed to Ramallah in the West Bank to meet with Palestinians and progressive Israeli groups. This region is, is in chaos and, and Canada needs to play a role. The NDP's foreign affairs critic Heather McPherson spoke with CBC News before taking off. Joining her on the trip, NDP MPs Matthew Green and Lindsay Matheson, as well as Liberal Salma Zahed and Shafkat Ali. They have all called for a ceasefire. The group is scheduled to meet with Palestinian communities affected by the war and visit refugee camps. The trip is sponsored by a nonprofit group called Canadian Muslim Vote. Canada's immigration minister says he wants to rein in the number of foreign students and workers coming here. The aim, he says, is to help ease the national housing crisis. But as J.P. Tasker explains, finding the right balance may be difficult. 2023 was a record-setting year for immigration. Federal data shows more than 800,000 non-permanent residents came to Canada. That's nearly the population of Winnipeg. It's an historic surge driven by international students and temporary workers. The challenge with the non-permanent resident targets is there are none. Uh, we, we have to take a look at that and rein it in in many areas. But Canada's immigration minister that. says the massive influx has stretched an already strained housing market. New limits on foreign students are coming in the first half of the year, he says. It is an immigrants that, that raised interest rates, uh, but volume is volume and it's something that we need to look at. According to documents obtained by the Canadian press, bureaucrats warned the government two years ago a spike in migration would drive up home prices. The Liberal government pushed ahead with its ambitious plan. Obviously, you need to build homes if you're going to bring in people. The Conservative leader is suggesting a government led by him will take in fewer people. We need to make a link between the number of homes built and the number of people we invite as new Canadians. All the, um, the campus is completely full. So this international student yeah. says the total lack of homes at the University of Moncton is a major issue, but she's concerned about the stigma on students like her. It is pretty unfair to use them as scapegoat to, uh, to explain the wrong decisions that our political actors took in the past. We're exceptional in the world in, in, in being pro-immigration. This expert warns without some sort of limit, popular support for immigration could collapse arguing with housing and health care at a crisis point, adding nearly a million people a year doesn't help. Ignoring those trade-offs, I think, risks undermining that long-standing consensus that we've had in Canada. So, JP, this is a complex issue. What does the government have to weigh here? Ian, the government faces a tough balancing act. Appeal to voters who want to see the number of newcomers curbed amid a housing affordability crisis while well, keeping levels relatively high to prop up an economy that depends on immigration. Some economists warn slamming the door shut could throw Canada into a recession. The immigration minister also says the provinces should crack down on some questionable schools that accept huge numbers of foreign students. Miller warned that if they don't act, the federal government is prepared to go it alone. Ian? J.P. Tasker reporting from Ottawa. Tomorrow in Saskatchewan, a coroner's inquest into Canada's worst mass stabbing in recent history begins. In 2022, a man from the James Smith Cree Nation killed 11 people and injured 17 others in a matter of hours. Sam Sampson shows us how the community is preparing. It's been a long road, but finally, James Smith Cree Nation is closer to getting some, albeit painful, answers. It's going to re-trigger a lot <clears throat> for our people. Starting Monday, a provincial coroner's inquest will hear in excruciating detail what happened leading up to and during September 4th, 2022. 
That day, RCMP say 32-year-old Miles Sanderson killed 11 people and injured 17 others, most of them from his own First Nation. Miles forced his way inside. RCMP did share a timeline of the mass casualty last year, who was stabbed, when and where, but there's still so much to know. Not just about the killings, but how Sanderson, a wanted man at the time, was free to commit this violence. Everyone's talking about, you know, why was uh, the parole not uh, very stringent on, on this young man? And uh, that's the number one question that comes to my mind as well. The end goal is to get jury recommendations to prevent future tragedies. I think whatever the process is, uh, inquest, national inquiry, the important part is there need to be teeth to it. The James Smith chiefs hope to meet with federal and provincial officials after the inquest for accountability. They have their own recommendations to kick things off. They want self-administered policing on their First Nation, improved in-custody programs to help First Nations members address issues like trauma and addiction, better systems to alert First Nations when a member is released from custody, and effective programs to reintegrate offending members back into First Nations. The families who live here are protecting their privacy as much as possible before the inquest, leaving their chief with one plea. I'd just like to ask... Uh uh, our country, Canada, for many prayers for our people. Because weeks of reliving a nightmare could require support. Sam Sampson, CBC News, Melfort, Saskatchewan. An incident at a Toronto Maple Leafs game is now under investigation. The video shows a guard holding a person on the ground and kneeing them in the face and head. He then holds the person's face down in a splatter of blood. The May Police organization says it's cooperating with police. They didn't confirm the video, but said police did make an arrest in relation to an assault. Another volcanic eruption in Iceland is endangering an entire town. Unbelievable. I th thought that I would never live to witness this. The rush to evacuate and the risk to the community. Plus, Quebec limits English on storefront signs. Nothing free in Canada. So that is really difficult for us. Why some worry the move will keep businesses out. And musicals are on the rise, but you may not know it from the previews. All of these movies that we're still talking about, however many decades later, they didn't have to hide that they were musicals. Why some promoters are holding back. We're back in two. Iceland is dealing with its most serious volcanic event in decades. For the second time in less than a month, an eruption has forced residents of a small fishing town in the southwest of the country to flee. But last time, lava flowed away from Grundavik. This time, it's streaming into the community, burning homes and other buildings. Already, uh, several houses have gone under lava, so it's a very serious situation we're faced with here right now. Officials say no lives are at risk, but residents who fled are left to watch the destruction from afar, wondering if they'll have anything to go back to. I actually live in the house that I'm born in, and it's kind of it's it's a tough it's a tough thought to think that that this town might be over. Authorities say protective walls built recently have managed to divert at least some of the lava. In a televised address tonight, the country's president called it a black day for all of Iceland. In Quebec, some businesses are preparing to change their storefront signs as new language rules are introduced, requiring at least two-thirds to be French. And as Sarah Levitt explains, critics say it's going to be costly and time-consuming. For 10 years, Teresa Nguyen has been making sure customers leave her salon with the best nails possible. And she's been doing it in three languages, French, English and Vietnamese. We try to service them with the language they want. Now, though, she's worried about the language of her outdoor signs. Well, already Salon Vuong is OK. Uh, non-toxic because in this side it's like English side. The Quebec government has added new draft regulations to its language charter. They stipulate that while companies can still have English names, at least two-thirds of the signage on the outside of businesses needs to be in French. French should clearly predominate. 
Quebec is also closing any loopholes around product labeling, saying French descriptions must be included. During the five past years, Office Québécois Langue Française received 155% more complaints. So Quebecers are afraid uh, of uh, what's happening in French here. For the business, anything changed is cost, nothing free in Canada. So that is really difficult for us. The government estimates the changes will cost businesses between 7 and $15 million in all. But some say cost isn't the only issue. It's going to represent time uh, to uh, follow up to make sure that uh, business owners are okay regarding that new rules uh, in a context of shortage of labor and time that business owners do not have right now. Others worry about the reaction of out-of-province businesses. It scares off businesses that might want to come into Quebec because they're going to realize that they have higher costs. The government has brushed off these concerns, saying the changes are important for the preservation and promotion of French. Businesses have some time before making sure they comply. The regulations don't come into effect until June 1st, 2025. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Montreal. Billions of dollars in pandemic loans are about to come due, but some say they don't have the cash. I'm not looking for a handout. Give us a room to breathe. The potential impact on small businesses and the growing push for an extension. And Michael Bublé opens up about his process. Every single lyric should be an analogy into what this person is to you. How the Canadian came up with some of his biggest hits. But first, new musicals are hitting the box office, but some marketers are keeping a secret. It seems like the film industry has started this trend of not making them known as musicals. The National brings down the story shaping our world. Next. Denmark has a new king, King Frederick X, ascending the throne in Copenhagen today, succeeding his mother, Queen Marguerite, who formally abdicated after 52 years of rule. I think he's a uh, down-to-earth person, uh, feeling uh, fairly relaxed. Now we have a king, we've been used to a queen. The now former queen is the first Danish monarch in nearly 900 years to voluntarily step aside. In his first address as king, Frederick promised to unite his people. Movie musicals are marketing themselves a bit differently these days, not promoting the fact they're musicals. Magda Gebersalasa explains why. We have a new student. What's up, Katie? The cliques, the fashion, the famous one-liners. You could be really hot. You change, like, everything. Mean Girls is back with new faces hitting new notes. The original Tina Fey, Lindsay Lohan movie came out 20 years ago. Then it hit Broadway as a musical, and now it's a musical on the big screen too. I love musicals. Australian and Gowry Rice takes on the role of Katie Heron. I know that this is going to be something really special. But the trailer doesn't give away that it's a musical, something we're seeing more of. Mr. Wonka, I can see you're a man of great engineering. The holiday box office winner, Willy Wonka, wasn't loud about marketing itself as a musical either. Then you've got the musical remake of The Color Purple. Even last year's blockbuster Barbie got bit by the musical bug. It seems musicals are back but with a marketing twist, says this culture writer. It seems like the film industry has started this trend of not making them known as musicals. A call likely driven by box office results. This film analyst says musicals just didn't do as well in the last few years. Right after the pandemic, uh, some of the more serious musicals like West Side Story, Dear Evan Hansen, in the Heights, underperformed relative to expectations at the box office. Still, this critic thinks not marketing the movies as musicals is short-sighted. Often the movies that are standing the test of time are movie musicals, right? Like, it's, you know, The, the Sound of Music and Grease and Singing in the Rain, all of these movies that we're still talking about however many decades later, and they didn't have to hide that they were musicals. Marketing aside, more musicals are on the way. Wicked Part One is heading to theaters this year, and the musical sequel to The Joker has Lady Gaga set to sing on screen again. 
Magda Gebra Salasa, CBC News, Toronto. Canada has taken the bronze in the World Women's Under-18 Hockey Championship in Switzerland. Rebound chance, Stonehouse! She'll do it! Back-to-back -back goals by Abby Stonehouse, Canada. In an 8-1 victory, Team Canada beat Finland. The U.S. won goal, the Czech Republic taking home silver. Now it's that time to dig deeper into the news shaping our world. I'm feeling good. He's topped the charts and tours the world. Now, Canada's Michael Bublé breaks down how one oh, special piano yeah. helped make it all possible. I have celebrated over this piano. I've cried my head off. But first, with billions in federal COVID loan repayments due within days, small business owners who don't have the money are worried. And what are my options? I'm 60 years old. What am I supposed to do at this point? For its part, Ottawa says it's been flexible and can no longer push back the deadline. Nick Purden breaks down the challenges facing small business owners and the call to wipe the debts. What would you call that number? Loss for a government. Loss revenues. Loss income. That's half a million dollars. One small business. It's my livelihood on the line. You do what you do in order to stay alive. And that's why we took the loan. It doesn't help to be angry or sad, but you're under stress. You're under a lot of stress. Why is the government doing this? Small businesses are the backbone of the economy. That's why during COVID, the federal government loaned out $49 billion to help almost a million businesses across the country survive the pandemic. But has the Canadian economy bounced back enough for small businesses to pay those loans back? And what's at stake for the country? Lola Jones owns a consignment clothing store in North Bay, Ontario called Buried Treasure. The store is my life. It's my job. It's how I make a living. It's my pension. It's my retirement. It's, it's everything. Like many small business owners, Lola was forced to close her store for months during the pandemic. Just because the doors were shut didn't mean that my bills stopped as well. I had rent mortgage, property tax, and I had no income coming in. I mean, we took the loan finally because we had no other choice, we felt. It was either that or lock the doors. The loan Lola took is the SIBA loan, $60,000 interest-free, backed by the federal government. So you got the last of their kind. All right. But now fast forward to the present, and for Lola, and many small businesses across the country, the end of the pandemic wasn't the end of their economic problems. Every other small business owner that I know, it's taking every cent for them just to stay alive right now. So that comes to 42, 30. Everything that you can possibly conceive has gone up. So it's become a struggle just to meet your everyday needs, let alone pay a loan that you got to stay afloat in the first place. Where are you at with paying the loan back? I think we've paid $100. No joke. And I'm sorry. What is it that makes you feel like that? That you've been kicked. Like the blood, sweat, and tears that I put into this to provide for my family. You just took the life out of us. It makes you feel like giving up. Like I, unless there's divine intervention, there's just no way we're able to pay this back by the 18th of January. It's just, it's just not going to happen. Yeah. So <laughs> it comes to 21.97. If the SIBA loan isn't paid off by the 18th, it will start to accrue 5% interest. And Lola says she can't afford that. It's that kind of struggle that has Mo Tabesh working to get all SIBA loans forgiven. Mo is an accountant in Ottawa. It's when you start a small business, a personal small business, you put your life into it. So seeing that if small businesses don't pay this loan, they will close the doors, I mean, that is hurtful to me. It's watching something die. So I don't, I don't like to see that. Mo has hundreds of small businesses as clients. And he says he started to notice that many of them were struggling and wouldn't be able to pay their SIBA loans back. So he started a petition, 
pushing the federal government to forgive all outstanding SIBA loans. Thousands of people have signed it so far. Thousands of people signing a petition in this magnitude means we need help. But don't forget the Canadian government is owed $49 billion from almost a million small businesses. Some people will say, you took out the loan, you know the terms of the deal, pay it back. So what would you good say? Good point, good point. If we are talking about fairness, when COVID happened, Canadian government and came and introduced CERB. CERB was stay home, we'll give you $20,000 and don't even pay it back. And then on the other hand, Canadian government came with the CBA loan to help small businesses. And this meant take the risk, keep your door open, and now we're going to ask for the CBA loan back. That's not fair. The federal government insists they've been more than flexible, having extended the repayment date of the CBA loan several times. But Mo says that's not good enough. I've crunched the numbers, and I can tell you that it is cheaper for the Canadian government to forgive this rather than waiting and watching the small business go bankrupt because they couldn't afford to pay the CBA loan. Mo shows me some ballpark calculations he's made using a hypothetical small business employing 10 people. Let's say that small business cannot pay SIBA loan because government didn't forgive it. So unfortunately, all those 10 people would go on EI. Adding up what the government would have to pay out in unemployment insurance and what they would lose in taxes, Mo has a pretty startling number. So you're saying a small business of 10 employees, if they can't pay the SIBA loan back, they go bankrupt, the government would be out half a million dollars? That's correct. What does that tell you? Sad. It doesn't make sense. That means the government doesn't know small businesses. That means small business doesn't have a voice. This is not politics. This is Canadian economy. The Parliamentary Budget Office has crunched some numbers of their own. They estimate that extending the loan another year would cost $900 million. But behind the numbers are thousands of small businesses on the brink, many of them restaurants. 91% of restaurants took the loan to survive COVID. And according to their national association, one in five can't pay it back. Mohamed Rabah owns the Golden Pita in Ancaster, Ontario. I'm a Lebanese immigrant. I came here at the age of six. This restaurant here, which I have owned and operated for 11 years, I've put my heart and soul in it. And <clears throat> to see it going down is, is very difficult. Mohammed tells me his business is still way down since COVID, and he won't be able to afford the monthly payments to finance his SIBA loan. Where the hell am, uh, am I supposed to get that money from? I don't have that money. I barely make ends meet. I mean, what are my options too? I'm, I'm, I'm 60 years old, what I'm supposed to do at this point. Mohammed tells me he started to think about what would happen if he has to shut down. There are employees that are gonna lose their jobs. Uh, I'm gonna lose my livelihood. Um, my family is gonna suffer. There's a lot at stake here. Thousands of other small businesses are also in jeopardy. So I'm only one of them. You know, it means it's a, it's a tremendous impact on, on small businesses across the country. Mohammed has a very simple message for the federal government. All I want the government to do is extend the SIBA loan for another year, give us a room to breathe, give us a room to, to, to maneuver. Things are, are beginning to improve. I don't want any handouts. I'm not looking for a handout. All I want is more time to pay it. That's all I'm asking. Nick, you spent a lot of time with Mohammed at his restaurant. At this point, just a few days from the deadline, what's he thinking about doing? Well, Thursday is the deadline for small businesses across the country to get some SIBA loan forgiveness. So up to $20,000. So Mohammed borrowed $60,000. To get the $20,000 forgiven on Thursday, he would have to pay $40,000 or refinance. He doesn't have $40,000. He went to the bank to try to refinance. They said, 
you have too much debt, much of it he accrued during COVID. So he said the only way he can get the $20,000 forgiven this week is to put the whole thing on his credit card. This is one of the decisions that small businesses across the country are faced with. Yeah, tough situation, Nick. Thank you. Coming up, Michael Bublé shares his passion for music. I have laughed over this piano. I have celebrated over this piano. I've cried my head off. The Canadian superstar's formula for success is next. as Michael Bublé became a huge international star, breathing new life into classic pop, jazz, and show tunes. And many of his hit songs have one common link. This piano has been, it's weird because it's been a massive part of my, my life. The decades-old piano that helped launch a remarkable career. I met with Michael for a feature interview that airs next week. We talked about his path from Burnaby, B.C. to the international stage and so much more that we couldn't get it all in. So tonight, we're playing a segment where he explains how some of his biggest hits were written starting at that piano. We got this piano, and I, I never learned to play the piano. I never learned the theory of music. I, I wrote music. I would write in my head and sit with it, dictating it onto a... a even my charts, even when... People hear feeling good, or and they hear those horn things. That was me and David Foster, me singing out the strings, singing oh. out the parts. So we bought this piano because my dad is frugal, and uh, it was a uh, affordable piano. Mm -hmm. But the magic thing was, was that it had a player. Ah. So at Christmas, we could plug it in, mm -hmm. and like it would play Christmas music. And we could like sing to Christmas songs yeah. and stuff like that. That was really what would happen. And then... Um, not cheesy at all. Not cheesy at all, <laughs> no. And then what happened is, I didn't know this, but if you take a piano like this, and you take a mind like mine, and you add alcohol and other things, <laughs> it is incredible the creative juices that start flowing. And I would sit down, I... I've, I mean, I've, 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 no joke, I mean, it, this sounds cheesy, but I have, I have laughed over this piano. I have celebrated over this piano. I've cried my head off. Uh, I wrote a song called uh, Forever Now. I love you forever now on this piano. Uh, thinking about my kids and, mm. um, and I've been absolutely shit-faced <laughs> writing It's a Beautiful Day. When you said good So it's, this piano has been, it's weird because it's been a massive part of my, my life, my history, my, my discography, and now what's really cool, this is the first time I've ever done this and mm -hmm. talked about it like this, but that my babies have lessons from Leon Feldman, you know, every Tuesday and Thursday, mm -hmm. and say we hate it, we don't want to do the lessons, uh, but then sit for hours and hours to show me how amazing their rendition of Spider-Man is. Um, it's one of those really full circle, really cool. It's really, it's such a cool thing. Yeah. You know? it, it, so it, much history in this little piano. I am so lucky to work with people that are so much smarter than me. <laughs> this is great. They're making me look amazing. Like, I, for instance, everything. When I wrote everything, um, Cynics would say that it's a, a really formulaic way of writing, but I knew that this, that song, exactly what it was. You're a fallen star, you're the getaway car, you're the line in the sand. When I go too far, you're the swimming pool on an August day, and you're the perfect thing to say. I had written the melody. Uh, and taking it to Alan, and he'd sped it up double time. He'd give a double time feel to the tempo, which completely gave the song a new birth. Hmm. And then I said to Amy, what I want is to write a song, and I want to use analogies. Every single uh, lyric should be an analogy into what this person is to you. And, and so we, would sit, she, we sat on a bus, and it was her saying, 
you're a falling star, you're the getaway car. You're that line in the sand when I go too far, you're a swimming pool on a hot August And this is just coming out just like This that? is us arguing, wow. like brother and sister, you know? <laughs> and me going, well, that's that, yeah, and, and her going, well, that's really, you know, that's, you know, really sophomoric. <laughs> and me going, yeah, but it's super romantic. And, and us fighting each other, but really, love, we love each other. You know, to this day, we yeah. have the same exact, um, we have the same relationship. I feel like I, I, I believe Compromise breeds mediocrity. I don't know how you feel about your, when you're, as a journalist, when So I'm you're, a big compromiser. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I mean, sometimes, yeah. you know, as a Canadian especially, I'm, I don't want confrontation. Yeah. I want to be really nice. But there's this half of me that realizes to protect the integrity of what I'm creating and knowing that gutturally, I, it has to be, it has to be right. There's only one right way. And so I find myself pushing back mm -hmm. in a really hard way. And, uh, and sometimes I'd find myself, even with Foster, I'd, I'd push back really hard. And, uh, and I'd push and I'd push. And finally, he'd push back. And he'd say, well, no, damn it. You know, this is the, why we, this can't have that third verse. At the turnaround, we're taking too long getting to the chorus. And I'd go, OK, good. Now I know. Now I know, because you fought back. You know, I, I, you know what I mean. I was looking for that. Huh? I thought you were going to say you got your back up at that point and got stubborn, but no, you were looking for no, a little bit of pushback. I want the pushback because then I know. Okay, now you've pushed me back. Okay, now your your gut is telling you, you know, Buble, you're wrong. You know how I feel. It's a new dawn. It's a new day, it's a new life for me. And I'm feeling good. I remember working with Max Martin, and if you don't know who Max Martin is, if you don't know who Max Martin is, Go to Google and Google <laughs> Max Martin, and you'll see that everything that you've listened to the last 27 years wow. has probably been touched by Max Martin. And uh, I remember going into the studio and sitting down with him, and, and, and he sort of has this beautiful team of Swedish mafiosa, you know, uh, musicians. And one of the first things that they said, and I realized the, that day, it, it was their motto. And they didn't just say it, they lived by it. And that was, we do what's ever best for the song. Hmm. The song is first. Our egos, our feelings, no. Whatever is best for the song. And I think uh, over 20 years or more, 25 years, now I know that, that that's always a way to, to keep that integrity and to create what, what I hope is lasting uh, and meaningful art. And you can catch our full-length feature interview with Michael Bublé next Sunday on The National. Coming up, a winter storm leaves BC drivers stuck, so a Vancouver man steps in. I started seeing cars not be able to go up, and I started some people kind of sliding down the hill, too. His friendly act during freezing conditions in our moment. As a cold snap hits Canada, people are braving frigid temperatures, snow, and of course, ice. And not all cities are equipped for those conditions. Here in Vancouver, a slippery hill slowed traffic to a stop, but a local resident couldn't stand idly by. And tonight, his take on roadside assistance is our moment. I think people started to think I was a, um, like a traffic person, like I was actually working outside. I started seeing cars not being able to go up, and I started some people kind of sliding down the hill too, and so that's what kind of prompted me to just get out of bed and say, I'm just gonna go outside and see what I can do. And so I just started with one car and, and then got one up the hill. It was pretty icy. Um, there was another guy that helped me out. We were just kind of instructing and helping people kind of how to get up the hill. At first, I actually thought his car was stuck and that he was pushing his car. And then I noticed him help like at least four other cars. 
I think it, it must have been like an hour or something like that. We all know, and especially driving, going home, and you're sliding down. You think you're gonna hit cars. It's it's a nightmare. So I would, yeah. I mean, I would do it again. I just think it's a really, you know, good thing that we have people in the community that are willing to help. As someone who grew up in New Brunswick where we had a lot of snow and people had studded tires and a plan, you know, the trucks would come by with salt, you got to understand in Vancouver, we don't have a lot of salting happening on the streets and people don't have studded tires and every once in a while it gets icy like that, so people need to step in as he did. Thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to the National's YouTube channel. I'm Ian Hanamansing in Vancouver. See you Friday.